Hello, the topic of this video lecture is stress and prominence in English language. I will first talk about the definition of word stress, what the elements of stress are, and what different types of stress there are. Secondly, we'll take a look at how word length influences stress placement. Finally, word stress may be used distinctively in English in three different ways. Specifically, as you can see on the screen, part of speech disambiguation, adjective plus noun versus compounds, and in derivation. Finally, I will briefly talk about stress loss or shift. I will give you exam definition of it and some examples. So let's take a look at what stress is. There is a very short definition which says that word stress is a feature used to give prominence to one or more syllables within a word. Usually, this is a type of prominence we tend to apply to words produced in isolation, as we find them in a dictionary. Now, the impression of stress is not usually due to a simple feature of higher intensity of the relevant syllable, but it is often caused by a combination of pitch movement, the length of the vowel at the core of the syllable, and the intensity, rather than by any one of these three features in isolation. Intensity actually seems to play the weakest role in creating the impression of prominence. Pitch has the strongest, and length occupies the middle ground. Most approaches to word stress distinguish between three possible levels. Primary stress marked by upper mark, as you can see here on the screen, like an apostrophe preceding the relevant syllable. Secondary stress marked by a lower mark, such as a comma, preceding the syllable in question. And finally, the third is unstressed. Let's take a look at an example. The word independent has five syllables. In, de, pen, dent. Obviously, I'm bad at counting. It has four syllables. Where first syllable carries the secondary stress, it means that you should put some power into this part of the word. The second syllable, d, is unstressed. The third syllable, pen, carries the mark of the primary stress which means that you should put most of your power from your lungs into this part of the word. And finally, the fourth syllable, dent, is unstressed, independent. So this was a nice long word, uh, as we said, four syllable word in English. Let's take a look at how word length influences stress. So we're talking, distinguishing between monosyllabic and polysyllabic words. In general, word stress in monosyllabic words is very simple. They are usually stressed if they are content words, such as verbs or nouns and adjectives, and unstressed if they are function words, such as prepositions, articles, pronouns, and so on and so on. Especially because the function words tend to have weak forms. Now, waters can get a bit muddied in English, like with anything else, Content words can become unaccented in context if they contain uh, previously mentioned or given information, and function words can become accented when they are used emphatically or contrastively. On the other hand, with polysyllabic words, the situation becomes far more difficult, especially because the stress patterns of different languages have influenced English vocabulary, as you have probably learned about from, uh, in your courses on English history and introduction to the uh, study of English language. As a very general rule, Germanic words tend to have their stress on the first syllable, whereas Latin, Greek, or French words usually have it further towards the end. However, morphological processes and factors do have a considerable effect on stress placement. Um, apart from the potential loss of one of the stresses in compounding or adjective noun pairs, it is especially the influence of suffixes that causes the shift or, or, or reassignment of stress in finding its place. Of course, it is by no means that all suffixes produce such an effect. For example, inflectional ones such as ing or ed or s 
never attract or influence stress in words. Uh, also, certain derivational suffixes, such as uh, able or less or ness, also do not affect stress either. While others, such as sion or tion or ia, tend to either push the stress onto the preceding syllable or the final syllable of the stem word. When we talk about prefixes, such as con, this, in, im, or an, which are all negative uh, prefixes, they never attract stress, of course, unless they are used contrastively, which is a mistake that is commonly made by foreign learners of English. Now, the, effect, the effect of different suffixes on stress patterning is a very complex topic, but I won't discuss it in detail here, as long as you are aware that they can make a certain influence. Let's take a look at the three different ways stress can uh, make a difference. So we can employ stress to disambiguate between grammatically polysemous words. So cases where we have different pronunciation depending on whether the word is a noun or a verb. Um, let's take a very mm, common example such as present as a noun and present as a verb. We can clearly distinguish a difference in the patterns here. In the noun, present, we clearly have a peak of higher intensity on the first syllable, whereas the peak on the second syllable in the verb, present, is not quite distinct, probably because the first syllable contains a reduced vowel, uh, while the vowel in the second syllable of the noun is completely deleted, which also makes the noun shorter than the verb. As far as the pitch is concerned, there seems to be a clearer continued fall throughout the noun, starting from the peak on the first syllable. In the verb, there is a rise towards the stressed syllable with a relatively steady downdrift following it. Present, present. Let's take a look at the next exercise. So there are 12 or six pairs actually here of words used as verbs and as nouns. Like in the first two example, we have a word C-O-N-T-R-A-S, sorry, T-R-A-C-T, used as a noun in number one and as a verb in number two. What would be the pronunciation of it? In number one, sign the contract. And in number two, muscles contract. As you can see, A transcription matches example number one, and B transcription matches the use of the word in example number two. Why don't you take a look at the other five um, pairs and see if you can match them. I'll give you a minute for this. Okay, let's take a look at the key. So why don't you see or check your work against the key to see how well you guessed and how many did you guess correctly? So I'll just read the phrases. And number three, a loud protest as a noun and as a verb to protest the new law, rebel without a cause as a noun, and children rebel as a verb, conduct your business as a verb, and code of conduct as a noun, don't insult my intelligence 
as a verb and add insult to injury as a noun. In the final pair, produce a movie, which is a verb, and farming produce, which is a noun. I would also like you to think of further word pairs that would illustrate <clears throat> this phenomenon. Also, think uh, whether there are all other means of achieving this type of a disambiguation, and we'll talk more in our next class. Second case where stress can help is in distinguishing adjective noun pairs versus compounds. What we have here is black bird versus blackbird. When they occur in isolation or form complete noun phases, here we can observe clear differences in two patterns. The adjective noun pair, black bird, shows a clear pause between the two words, whereas the period of relative silence in the compound is most likely only due to the release phase of the voiceless consonant um, <clears throat> in the first part, blackbird. Uh, the second syllable in the first sample, black bird, is also clearly longer than in the compound, blackbird, where it seems relatively compressed and both syllables are of similar length, blackbird. The adjective noun pair, black bird, also exhibits a clear pitch reset at the beginning of the second word, while the pitch contour for compound is again a relatively steady falling one, blackbird. The main peaks of intensity for both examples are approximately the same height for both syllables. So in, obviously in this case, intensity does not seem to be the distinguishing factor. Again, see if you can think of other examples that would uh, illustrate this phenomenon and we'll discuss it in class. Let's move on to the exercise. Take a look at this list of examples and decide which of these examples are compounds and which are phrases. I'll give you 30 seconds to look at it. Okay, let's take a look at the key. Uh, primary and secondary stresses are marked here. Uh, words with double primary stress are adjective noun phrases. So farmhand, farmhand is a compound. Left hand is an adjective plus noun phrase. Shorthand, a compound locker room, compound, big room, adjective plus noun phrase, and so on and so on. How many did you guess correctly? Okay, you'll tell me in class. Moving on to the final third case where stress can mark, make a difference. So stress can mark certain der derivational effects. Here is an example of a, ver of a word photograph versus the verb photography, which is derived from the word photograph. So um, these derivation, this derivational effect is caused by addition of specific suffix. Here we can recognize uh, that the, there are two distinct peaks of intensity on the first and third syllable in the first noun, whereas there is only one uh, peak on the second syllable in the derived noun, although photography is a longer word because it has an added suffix. Each movement in the second word in photography begins on the accented syllable and exhibits a relatively steady downdrift. Discussion of and the function of examples of word stress above should have made clear this is obviously a very again complicated issue to tackle. However, 
What should also have become apparent is that certain features help us determine where the highest prominence is most likely to fall within a word. Um, maybe first and, and maybe the most uh, obvious is that syllables with long vowels or diphthongs tend to attract stress. Our weak or reduced syllables are far less likely to be accentuated. Uh, a distinction between primary and secondary stress is often difficult to make if a word contains two syllables with strong vocalic elements. Uh, when there, are, there is such a case, pitch usually plays a decisive role. But as we've seen, interpreting the pitch patterns correctly may be made difficult by, I don't know, the effects of voiceless consonants or other intonational, intonational cohesive effects. Although, you can always rely on your ears because they seem to be pretty good at resolving any ambiguities uh, in language. Apart from this, uh, most speech analysis programs uh, have problems in representing pitch patterns probably, so rely on your ears. Finally, uh, let's briefly discuss stress shift and loss. Um, word stress, as we've seen, is not an absolutely rigid phenomenon, but may be modified in certain contexts or by certain morphological or uh, syntactic processes especially when you try to package together a lot of information into larger units of sense. Then we often tend to suppress some of the accents that would naturally occur in <clears throat> sorry, isolated polysyllabic words. So that stress seems to disappear or shift to the next accentuated position. Let's take a look at the example. So we have two words together, afternoon and the word tea used together as a, a group sense, sense group, it will be afternoon tea. Here, the relevant deaccented items are marked in the swear brackets. So noon used to be, or it is, when the word is in isolation, is a marked syllable or, or a stressed syllable, but not when it's grouped together with the word tea. The same would go for Saturday afternoon, when grouped together, you would have Saturday afternoon, where you have af as previously stressed syllable, now lost its stress completely. Uh, so any intervening syllables here uh, in between uh, tend to become weakened, compressed, and finally shortened. So this is stress shift or stress loss. For you. And that is finally the end of this short video lecture. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, for your further detailed reading on stress in English, you are provided with the materials in uh, Google Classroom. Till next week.